Ray knew interference when he saw it. What is this? His daughter, Christine, was apparently the main voice of the group. We wanted to talk to you about mom. Ray looked at his wife, but her face was expressionless. He hoped against all hope that this was not what he thought it was. He looked at his daughter again. What's wrong with mom? Mom told us about Luke. Yes, did you tell me? Ray asked, his voice sounding incredulous. Yes, and about your problems. Ray simply stared at his wife, amazed that she would share such personal information with anyone, much less their children and grandchildren. My problems and all this in general are none of your business. But mom's happiness is our business. Mom's happiness is your business? I guess that means my happiness doesn't matter and I have to give up everything I hold dear? Christine sighed and said, But mommy has needs and you can't satisfy them. If you had needs that she couldn't satisfy, do you think she would interfere with you? For the first time since this conversation began, Josie flinched and suddenly found an interesting place on the dining table. As she did this, she said, Christine, that's enough. Everyone looked at her, then back at me as I started laughing. Oh, Christine, I think you just made the biggest mistake ever. I asked, would you like to hear an interesting story? Josie stood up and screamed, Ray, don't do this. But I laughed and replied, it's your problem. It's up to you to sort it out. So where should I start? Christine, when you were born, your mother refused sex. For almost three years, she could not satisfy my needs. She even sent me a letter about it, which I have right here. Let me quote. I made a theatrical gesture as I pulled the letter out of my top pocket. I kept it in my sock drawer all these years because it made me feel good that I gave up part of my life for the love and happiness of my wife. Now I wanted to see my wife cringe at the hypocrisy of her own words when I quoted directly from her written word. Ray, I know you have needs, and I just can't meet them right now. It would be so easy for you to find a woman who could, but if you did, the pain you would cause me would be huge and our marriage wouldn't survive. I'm begging, no, I'm begging. Please don't go outside of our marriage. I need you to put your needs on hold until this depression goes away. I don't know how long it will be, but hopefully soon. Please, please stay true to me, just as I will be true to you if the roles are reversed. So for almost three years, we didn't have sex. We had sex once at the end of three years, and Leo was the result. It took another four years of rare sex, and I mean, once every other month if I was lucky before, then our sex life began to return to normal. So, Christine, your mother and I spent almost seven years with no or very little sex, and I didn't look outside of our marriage. Was I a devoted husband or a fool? The question hung in the air like an unpleasant odor. Josie's face turned red from humiliation, but also from anger. I knew that she would not like quoting her own words because she always believed that I should give her more than she gave me. Christine was confused, but she pulled herself together and said, Dad, it was a long time ago and you may never get over it, so Mom may never experience it again. My laughter filled the room. I looked at Eric and said, I understand that Christine is going through a similar drought. If I were you, I'd go out and sleep with everything that moves because in 20 years she'll be cuckolding you the same way. Christine blushed and said, Who told you that? I simply said, Your mother told me about this a couple of weeks ago when she said you had the same problem as her. I assume you wouldn't mind Eric getting his needs met? While Christine was stuttering and getting angry, I looked at Rebecca and said, how are you doing with sex? Should Leo prepare the ground to be able to date someone freely when you hit a dry spell? I saw a lot of angry faces, and I smiled and said, You all seem happy to be served, but very unhappy to find yourself in my place. Christine came up to me and said, This is completely different. Mommy needs it and you can't do it. Accept it. I looked at them all and said, Goodbye. I turned on my heel and headed for the door. Julie and Allison called after me. What about fireworks? I replied, there are enough fireworks here for me today. Go and enjoy them. I suspect my presence will ruin everyone's fun. 
I went out and got into the car. Josie was standing in the doorway as I pulled out of the driveway, but she didn't try to stop me. I drove aimlessly, not knowing what to do. After all, today was the 4th of July and everything was closed. My phone rang once with Rebecca's number. She left a voicemail saying she was sorry about the ambush and that she and Leo thought it was wrong, but Christine basically talked them into agreeing with her. About 30 minutes later, I found myself outside the office, so I drove in, parked, and went inside. For that matter, I wanted to drink real coffee. Josie made me drink decaf, and I didn't like it. As I sat at my desk, I decided to make a list of my options. Without thinking, the first word on the list was divorce. I do not know why, it was just there in front of me. I sat back and enjoyed my coffee, thinking about the word, and I realized that I had no choice if I wanted to be true to myself. I gave up my needs for her, but when the roles were reversed, she refused. No matter how secret it was, everyone will know, and I simply cannot live such a life. No, it was a scam. So what's next? The words, place to live and divorce lawyer, appeared on the page as if by themselves. I opened my computer and googled divorce lawyer. A whole page of results appeared. At the top of the second page was a name I recognized, Lindsay Logan. She was handling the divorce of one of my golfing friends, and I knew her casually through a charity we both supported. She was young, attractive, but this only made meetings easier, and was like a bull in a china shop when the situation demanded it. I went to her web page and filled out a form requesting a meeting. I received an automated response to my email stating that I would be called back within 24 hours to offer an appointment. Now where to live? I couldn't live alone. I didn't know how to cook, clean, or wash my own clothes, but I didn't want to move into a nursing home. As I thought about it, an ad I saw came to mind. It was an advertisement for a service department complex on the other side of town. It was for people who were recently divorced and needed exactly what I needed, a housekeeper. Everyone had their own apartment. It had an entrance from the parking lot and a back door to the complex, where a small restaurant offered food, laundry, cleaning and ironing, and a housekeeper to clean the apartment. After a few Google searches, I found the phone number for the complex. I called, forgetting what day it was, and was surprised that they answered. It turns out that a manager or assistant manager is on site 24 hours a day and would be happy to show me around the complex at any time. I asked if I could come now, and the answer was, sure, why not? The journey from the office to the complex took about 45 minutes, mainly due to road closures for the fireworks display. The manager showed me the complex and the apartment that was for rent. To my surprise, I knew two of the residents and was invited to watch the game with them in the main hall. I had a good time with some old friends and new ones. I even drank beer. After the game, Sam, who I used to go fishing with before we both got married and lost touch, asked me why I was there. I said, My wife has decided she wants a younger model and she doesn't understand why I'm not happy. Sam looked at me and said, Josie has always been selfish, but this is colder than I thought she could be. I said in surprise, Did you know her? Sam made a strange face and said, Of course I was her brother's friend. Dated her when we were probably twelve, when six weeks seemed like a lifetime, and lived in the same area until we were fifteen. I was surprised, saying, I didn't know about that. You lived in Hillview when we went fishing. Yeah, Sam replied. My parents moved there just before we met, and then we somehow lost touch when you were dating Josie. I think she didn't want you around me and kept you away. From me. If you remember, there were always weekends for you too when the boys would go out and stuff like that. You lost touch with all the boys. How many of your friends now were your friends before you met Josie, and how many were Josie's friends when you met? It was an interesting question, and I knew the answer right away. Nobody. It was a shock, and at the same time, not. I always did what made her happy, and if there was a conflict between her happiness and mine, she always won. This story with Luke was simply the culmination of this selfishness. I went to the manager's office and said I would take the apartment. 
We completed the paperwork and I took out my card to pay the deposit. The manager looked at her and said, I think you should open a new account before you pay me. You don't want your soon-to-be ex-wife to know where you are. I haven't even started to think about bank accounts, phones, etc. He suggested that I go to a new bank tomorrow and open an account. He looked at my phone and said, Upgrade this brick too. You'll need a smartphone for the banking app and social media. My face was full of surprise as he laughed, saying, Don't worry. After a week here, you'll consider your smartphone an old friend. I went home to an empty house. The fireworks had ended, so I knew they would clear out the stalls and return home around 10.30 at night. That gave me 45 minutes. I went to the office and collected all the financial information the lawyer asked for in the automated email. I kept everything organized, so it was easy to copy everything. I put it all in the car and got in when they broke into the house. Everyone stopped and looked at me as if I had just popped balloons. Christine turned and said, Everybody go home. Mommy and I will finish this with Daddy. The others couldn't wait to get out of the house, leaving Josie and Christine standing in the doorway looking at me while I sat in my rocking chair looking at them. Josie began to attack me. Why did you bring up everyone's personal problems? It was personal, and that letter was written from the heart. I'm devastated that you used it against me. Christine continued. You ruined what should have been a perfect day with your nonsense and then walked away like a petulant child. I didn't move or speak. I just looked at them. Finally, Josie screamed, Say something, we need an apology. I looked at Josie and then announced, Your affair is over. If he ever comes into this house again, we will get a divorce. Now get that worthless daughter out of this house before I say anything she will regret. Christine looked at me with contempt in her eyes and said, There will be no divorce. Now find a way to deal with your wounded pride. Otherwise you will never see your grandchildren again. I stood up and walked toward Christine in a way that would intimidate her. It was clear that the look on my face frightened her as my anger overtook her and she took a couple of steps back. Josie stepped between us and said, Christine, leave now and I'll deal with your father. As Christine quickly left the house, Josie said, How dare you threaten your daughter like that? I went upstairs and said, I'm moving into the spare room. Being in the same room with you makes me sick. Sleeping in the same bed is completely impossible. I moved some of my things into the spare room and closed the door. Josie used the spare key to open it, but I stood at the door and said, I'll push you out of this room if you don't leave. I'm not interested in being with you. She had a surprised and shocked look on her face, but she stepped back from the door, which I immediately closed in her face. I slept fairly well considering the circumstances and was up and gone the next morning before Josie was up. My first stop was at the office to ask for a few days off. I told my boss what happened and he told me to take a week off without using my vacation fund. The next morning at 9 o'clock in the morning, I received a call from the lawyer's office with an appointment for 3.30 in the afternoon. I took the time, then went to the bank to open a new account. A bank employee showed me how the banking app works, and I found it very simple. Everything was set up to transfer half of the funds to my new account. Then I went to the mall and bought a new mobile phone and a contract. I went back to the bank and they set up a mobile banking app. After that, I went to the apartment complex and used the banking app to pay the deposit. From there, I went to a furniture store and ordered a new bed, furniture, TV, etc. for his new apartment and asked to have them delivered to the apartment by Wednesday. I also bought two large suitcases from a store nearby. At 3.30, I was at the office of my future lawyer. The secretary told me to come in, and when I entered her office, I was surprised. I always remembered Lindsay as attractive, but she was a vision sitting in front of me. She looked up and smiled. I said, You've changed since we last spoke. The smile turned into laughter. I was about 15 years old then. I hope I have changed and I hope for the better. I just couldn't stop smiling when I said, Absolutely. She obviously didn't remember me from the charity events where she must have dressed more modestly. After this, the meeting was entirely business. I told her what happened and gave her all the financial information. 
The offer would be that she would keep the house, half the savings, and receive alimony of $500 a month for two years. I will keep my pension, and she will continue to work. The papers will be ready for submission next Friday, but I have asked that they be submitted on Saturday morning. I returned home at the usual time and ignored Josie. I moved all my stuff into the spare room, then took the opportunity to pack my new suitcases without her noticing. The next morning I took both of them out to the car and drove away while she was still sleeping. I left my suitcases in the apartment. I'll take them apart when the furniture arrives. My old house had enough clothes left to last a week, plus whatever was dirty. After checking a few things I headed to the office. I actually had a very productive day and arrived home about an hour later than usual after eating at a healthy food store near the office. Josie looked at me and said, I cooked the lamb, but it's ruined. Why are you late? I just looked at her and said, well, no big deal, and went into the spare room, locking the door. I heard Josie knock on the door. We need to talk. We can't go on like this. I opened the door and said, don't tell me, Sherlock. I can't live with you cheating on me every weekend. Until this stops, nothing will change. Her face turned red and she screamed. You have no respect for my feelings, needs, or happiness. You need to get a grip and work on this marriage or it will end. I started laughing. I think you should look in the mirror and say this because you definitely don't respect my feelings, needs, or happiness. Now please leave me alone. The rest of the week passed in silence. On Thursday, I went after work to put all my stuff away since the new furniture had arrived. I also went to buy new bed linen and other necessary items. On Friday, I packed all the dirty clothes into a bag and took them to my new home to wash them. Saturday morning, I got up and packed the rest of my clothes and medications into my golf bag. Then I went downstairs. Josie was sitting at the table and said, If your golf course gets canceled because it rains... Don't get home until 10 so you don't see something you don't want to see. That's it. You don't care how I feel. You keep dating that Luke guy and I don't matter to your plans. She looked at me with a sad smile and said, You are the most important thing, but you can't take care of this part of my life, so I need someone to help. I woke up. Okay. You made your choice and I made mine. I went to the door and she said, What? No kiss? I turned and laughed in her face. Never again. I drove to Lindsay's office where I met with her and the bailiff and returned to my old house in the bailiff's car. We parked a few doors down from my house and waited. Sure enough, at about half past eight, Luke pulled into the driveway. At 8.45, the bailiff went to the door. It took several minutes for Josie to open the door and it was clear that they wasted no time. I saw the bailiff talking to her she nodded, then he took an envelope out of his bag and handed it to her. She refused to accept it and he spoke to her again, and this time she took the envelope. As he left, I saw Josie open the envelope, cover her mouth, then slam the door. Less than five minutes later, Luke left the house and drove away. The first call from Christine came within ten minutes. I answered the phone to a tirade. What the hell is this? Divorce my mother for what? because she feels good? I let Christine pour out her emotions until the phone went silent. I just sat there for another 30 seconds, then said, Are you done? This started another stream of curse words that I just let flow. Finally, she stopped and said, So what? My answer, So what? Made her hang up. Lindsay and I finished the rest of the paperwork so it could be delivered to Josie's lawyer. I also gave Lindsay limited power of attorney and the authority to represent me in court in the event I was unable to appear. As I was leaving, I saw Leo standing outside Lindsay's office. He looked at me and said, We're all looking for your car. I'm here to take you home so you can stop this stupidity. I walked past him and went to open my car. But when I reached the door, he held out his hand, preventing me from opening it, and said, Get in my car, now! I didn't move, but I said, if you don't take your hand away now. At that moment, Lindsay walked up behind Leo, put her hand on his shoulder and said, my client wants to leave, and you are in his way. If you don't get out of his way, I will arrange for you to spend 30 days in jail awaiting trial on a charge of false imprisonment. 
and you won't like it because you're too pretty to spend 30 days in jail. Leo's hand instantly pulled away from the car door, and I opened it to get in. When I had one foot in the car, Leo said, It's not over, Dad. You won't divorce Mom, and you won't move out of the house. With these words, he went to his car. Lindsay looked at me and said, I suspect this won't be easy, and walked back to the office. I got into my car and drove to my apartment, making sure I parked the car so that it couldn't be seen from the road. On Sunday, I met with the housekeeper, and we discussed my medications, dietary requirements, and other things related to my heart condition. They had a system in place to ensure all medications were taken and all meals met dietary requirements. On Monday afternoon, everything escalated. Lindsay called me and told me that Josie had hired an attorney, and their first action was to file for a protective order stating that I was unable to care for myself and asking the court to place me in Josie and Kristen's custody due to the need to manage my heart condition, disease. A preliminary hearing was scheduled for 10 o'clock the next morning. Lindsay asked for details about my doctor and the complex manager to prepare a defense. At the hearing the next morning, Josie's lawyer stood up and stated that I was unable to care for myself, that Josie was managing my entire medical condition, and I should be placed under her care. Josie was called into the dock and gave a very one-sided view of my inability to do anything on my own. Things started to go wrong when Lindsay asked her what she would do about the divorce suit if the order was granted, to which Josie replied, Of course I'll cancel it. Lindsay then turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, this is an attempt to stop the divorce. It has nothing to do with the well-being of my client, and sat down. Lindsay then called the complex's manager, who explained that it was a serviced complex, and they had a system in place to ensure medical and dietary requirements were met. She then called my doctor to the stand, who visited the complex to review the process, and he said it was as good as any system he had seen, and he had no objections. The judge looked at Josie's lawyer and called him to appear. After a heated exchange, the judge said, I am not making this order because it is clear that the health reasons are spurious, and the real reason is an attempt to stop the divorce. Everyone is discharged. After leaving, the doctor came up to me and said, Call me. I've been looking at your medical records, and I think we need to review them. Kristen hovered behind Lindsay, and when the doctor left, she said, Dad, this isn't over. You need to stop being so selfish and go back to your mom or she'll get mad at you and actually sign those papers. I laughed and said, oh, please let her do it, and quickly. The next day I was sitting in the doctor's office and he said, I noticed that you are still taking a very high dose of the ACE inhibitor, which is causing your blood pressure to be too low. I think we need to stop this drug completely. On, at your last check, your blood pressure was indeed too low. Starting today, I want to reduce the dosi by 10 milligrams per week. I will send a letter to Mrs. Davidson at your new address. Over the next two months, my blood pressure medications were reduced to zero. About two weeks after my last dose, I was sitting with Sam watching TV when the manager brought in a woman who was looking for an apartment to rent. I immediately found her attractive, but the slight reaction in my pants was a strange, embarrassing, but very pleasant sensation, a feeling I haven't felt in a very long time. The first divorce hearing finally took place after Josie delayed the process in every possible way. Lindsay presented the claim as a simple divorce based on irreconcilable differences and asked for it to be granted without delay. Josie's lawyer stood up and said the divorce was due to miscommunication on my part and asked for 12 sessions of counseling, which was the maximum in our state, so we could work through the issues and find a way to move forward. The judge looked at Lindsay and said, Your client has been married a long time. I think they should see if anything can be salvaged. Then, addressing the court as a whole, he said, I order that three sessions of consultation be held. Then the consultant is to report back to me on progress. The consultant is to be agreed between the parties. Choosing a consultant was traumatic. Josie's first suggestion was to use one of her friends from the golf club. This was immediately rejected, and we ultimately settled for a consultant who Lindsay knew would be impartial.
The first session started badly from the very beginning. Josie began by saying that she has needs, and it is not wise for me to interfere with their satisfaction. When I showed her the letter, which she tried to snatch from the counselor, saying it didn't matter, the counselor stood up for her, saying that she clearly didn't think marriage was equal. The second session was even worse because Kristen barged in halfway through, demanding that the counselor tell me to stop being selfish and tell the judge to stop the divorce. After the second session, the consultant wrote to the judge that there was no point in continuing since there was no prospect of saving the marriage. Over the next three months, Josie's lawyer used every procedural tool in the book to drag out the divorce, demanding medical and psychiatric evaluations, claiming that I am mentally unstable and that my medications are preventing me from making rational decisions. The last resort was taken two days before the final hearing. I was found capable of making my own decisions, and Lindsay filed a motion with the court to have this be a final hearing, a statement that would probably have been accepted. I sat in the main room talking to Angela, a new resident whose presence had made me nervous, one evening after dinner. We became friends and our mutual attraction grew with the days we spent together. I went back to the doctor, who explained that my ACE inhibitor dose was so high that I literally couldn't get blued to my extremities. It turned out that Josie insisted on keeping the medication high, thinking it was better for my health. As we were talking, two policemen and an elegantly dressed man came and asked who I was. When I gave my name, the man handed me an envelope saying, My children had been granted temporary powers of attorney and I was to be placed in protective custody until a full hearing. As I was physically removed from the building, I yelled at Angela to call Lindsay Logan, my lawyer, and ask her to find me. I was taken to a local hospital where I was placed in a bed in a secure unit. I heard from Lindsay at the front desk about two hours later, but she was told that the attorneys by proxy had forbidden her to see me. The next morning, at nine, Lindsay and the bailiff entered my room, followed by the nurse saying, You are not allowed to be here. The bailiff turned and handed her a piece of paper saying, This is a power of attorney that says we have the right. If you interfere with me, as an officer of the court, I can use any means necessary to gain access. And believe me, after what happened to him last night, I won't stand in ceremony with you. The nurse quickly moved aside and Lindsay came over to me saying, Get up quickly and get out of here, they're going to try to stop it. The bailiff released the handcuffs and we literally ran out of the hospital and got into a taxi. Lindsay took me to her house and sat me down with coffee to explain. I signed a power of attorney for my children during a heart attack. This gave them the right to make decisions regarding my medical care and finances if I became incapacitated. They activated it yesterday declaring me mentally incompetent and admitted me to the hospital. They had a hearing at 10 this morning, and if they could keep me out of it, they would be given authority over me and all my legal matters. Lindsay's plan was for me to be in court, but since the children told the police that I was a danger to myself and others, we had to be careful. We left Lindsay's house at 9.45 and took a taxi to the courthouse, entering through the back door. At 10 o'clock, the case was called, and when Lindsay came into court and sat down at the table for my defense, Kristen's lawyer objected, saying that she was fired by proxy and could not represent me. Lindsay stood up and said, Please ask Mr. Mulholland himself, and called me. The children jumped up, but the judge ordered them to sit down. I had a right to be here. Then the judge looked at me and said, You're not sick. Why was this case brought? Lindsay stood up and said, my client is in the process of divorcing his wife, and this is another attempt to stop him from doing so. The judge looked at his papers and said, Why is divorce not mentioned in these papers? This is a clear abuse of power of a tournay. I am dismissing this case. Miss Logan, when is the divorce hearing? She replied, In about an hour. The judge looked at the children's lawyer and said, if an objection to the divorce decree is filed by both of your clients, they will both spend 21 days in jail. The divorce went smoothly, and three months later, I became a free man. What happened to Angela? Well, the night the divorce decree was granted. We had a party, and when we danced, everything worked. Before we knew it, we were in bed and ending our friendship.
We don't make love too often, but once a week is what makes us both happy. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening to the next one.